You know how in a movie there's a musical score, the theme song, that gets repeated over and over, like it could be slow and romantic for a love scene, and then booming and fast-paced during an action scene. And in all those moments, you can still hear the same melody. All you probably recognize this music, and, and you're wondering what the fuck has to do with type. OK, hang, hang on. First, a little background about this project. For the last two years, maybe three, we've been working on an enormous branding project for a new food hall and market place, place by the superstar chef, Jean-Georges von Genrichten. It opens next month in New York's South Street Seaport, right there. And uh, right now we are all up there at Cooper. And this project was really complex and it really used all our areas of expertise. It's called the team building and our scope was this. The brand identity, signage and wayfinding, one food truck, one candy store, three bars, six sit-down restaurants, five fast casual counters, one food market with eight counters, an apparel line and home goods line with 12 SKUs, two groceries, it's getting boring, and a private label with 28 collections and more than 400 SKUs. Oof. Okay, so <laughs> after we stopped breathing into a paper bag, uh, we got to work. Uh, and since this is set in a historic location, well, we began by looking at the past. Uh, I'll give you guys some brief history here. So the Tim Building was originally built in New York in 1907, and it housed the famous Fulton Fish Market. It was a bustling, yet funky-smelling place with a colorful history. And it was the center of commerce, really at the center of the world. In later years, it was a place where you could find chefs haggling with mobsters over a tuna at 2 a.m., as they say, only in New York. But the best part about working on a project like this is there's plenty of reference material. And in this case, we had a boatload of it. From these old, beautiful letterheads and billheads, to old fishmonger calling cards, or I guess as we would call them today, business cards, uh, even to old signage. It was a true treasure trove, or as Mr. Bologna would call it, pure design porn. I would never do that. <laughs> but maybe there's such a thing as too much inspiration because someone went a bit overboard in the sketching phase. At a certain point, I really had to force Sean to stop iterating and take a step back to review, <laughs> okay? The truth is, while we loved all these, these, these curves and quirks of this vintage type that we were referencing, we felt that somehow these decorative letter forms didn't quite capture that, that gritty, unrefined essence of this place that we're branding. But it was then, while we were looking again at old photos of the Tim building, we realized that the answer was right in front of us all along. These old vendor signs and their typography with chamfered corners and mismatched widths, it perfectly captured the, that raw functional spirit of this old commercial space. In many ways, it was kind of the variable font of its time. 
And the more we looked around at other maritime signage, the more we realized how the style of typography really is intrinsically linked to this world. So back to the drawing board we went. We continued sketching to create something more related to this utilitarian world that I just mentioned. Of course, I couldn't help myself. Played with adding swashes and drop caps and shadows and all that fun stuff. But it was still too complex. But after sketching a little more and a little more, and once we landed on a skeleton that we felt good about, we felt like it was, it was bold and, and, and strong enough to really hold its own, that's when we added very intentionally uh, this inner beveling, kind of like a chiseled sign to align with our historical references and almost more importantly than that, to make it memorable. But the truth is, of course, this isn't a gritty fish market anymore, right? It's a high-end culinary destination by a world-famous chef. So we create a delicate monogram to elevate the brand to the caliber of Jean-Georges, while still referencing that maritime tradition of the place. Another way we used typography as a brand signature was to drop the initial caps below the baseline on the chef's name, something we'd seen and done in old print ephemera and we adopted as our own. The simple gesture became a key distinctive element of the Tim Building brand, and we carried it through everything from packaging to collateral, all the way even to signage. And it's really super fucking cool. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you again because it's, re it's small but really cool. Isn't it? <laughs> that was the <laughs> that was the applause you were looking for. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so other essential elements of the brand were this two-color uh, system of a light and a dark green, a border to contain these graphic elements. And I know you've been patiently waiting. The third and the, arguably the most defining element of this brand is, of course, our soundtrack, the font. So fast forward to no exit octagonal variable. This is a font we designed to accommodate really a project of this magnitude with literally hundreds of applications. As you saw, this is like a, probably the biggest project we've, we've had in the, in the canon of MUCA. We knew from the size of our scope that any custom font was gonna have to do some serious heavy lifting. Noixit was designed to fit on everything from a pack of mints, pretty small, all the way to the, to the side of, this, of the building. So that guy is 13 feet tall. It was gonna be 17 feet, but we scaled it down. <laughs> and now back to that music reference we started the talk with. The typeface is like a continuous melody played across the entire brand and its sub-brands. Its flexibility allowed us to riff off of it, like a song performed in different styles with different instruments and different arrangements. A great example of this is the identity system we created for the 11 food venues inside the building that needed to retain some visual link to the parent brand. So we started with the basic font, and then we gave each logo its own sound, its own rhythm, ultimately its own arrangement. So for Tea Cafe, which is one of the venues inside, the logo is inspired by old Italian espresso machines, where a mandolin is the perfect soundtrack. Italian, it should have had two F's, but whatever, <laughs> Americans. For the French Brasserie, the tune is performed by a sole accordionist at a romantic dinner under the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and 
And the truth is, that same melody is still recognizable, regardless of the arrangements or the instruments used to play it. Whether it be the London Symphony Orchestra, or in this case, a mariachi band, we still hear that same song. So as we continued on this, quite frankly, massive scope, uh, it became apparent what a powerful tool this flexible font was. It was really the glue that, that held this whole complex system together, allowing for moments of custom tailoring when necessary, right? like in the case of those uh, venues. And the ability of the font to expand and contract was incredibly valuable in the production phase. When we were working with both long and short names all on the same size label. For the dried herbs and spices alone, we had to design a system for over, factoring in for over 100 SKUs. And the area was pretty small, even though these guys look huge here. But aside from the practicality of the variable widths, the font also had the advantage of being kind of a blank canvas. It gave us the freedom to really manipulate this sound and to change the voice to suit our needs. So certain product collections were everyday items, like, like the teas. Meanwhile, on the other hand, we had more premium products like, like the high-end olive oils, vinegars. We even designed a collection of uh, chocolates here with a, with a world-famous chocolatier named Jacques Torres. And if we zoom into these for just a minute, you can see that by adding all these elements that I was trying to inject into the logo, the, the drop shadows and the, the foil outlines and the embossings and all these fancy print techniques, we were able to really elevate the packaging for certain collections that merited doing so, all while still retaining that brand connection. For other product lines, like the sauces, the marinades, the dressings, well, we broke one of the golden rules of design, making the net weight almost as big as the product name. And in effect, we were able to get a label system approved by the client that looks like little type specimens when they're all lined up on the shelf. Small victories. Go typography. <laughs> we were pretty excited about that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, for other products like the sparkling sodas, uh, we expanded the visual language yet again, <laughs> this time using backgrounds reminiscent of nautical flags with colors that helped us differentiate flavors. We really got to push the boundaries of this font, all while working on the collateral, specifically for the, the, the parent brand. So knowing that we would have a captive audience inside the building, already somewhat familiar with the brand, allowed us to be even more expressive with the type. And in this case, treat it almost as if it were an illustration. And this kitchen towel was designed for that rare combination of type nerd and home chef. We see you out there. So, as you can see, this was really a big effort. And like in all our projects, our goal was to create something that feels timeless, that w it won't be dated in five days. By drawing inspiration from the past without making a carbon copy of it, we really try to bring a sense of authenticity and longevity to this new iteration of this historic team building by Jean-Georges. And now, we conclude with, by sharing some of our secrets. Are you ready? Rule number one, when you have this kind of project, don't do a Disney. It's not a fucking theme park, okay? Rule number two, have rules, 
maybe this was supposed to be rule number one. Okay, uh, we created an explicit set of design rules during this project that we used to prevent the boat from veering into a storm. It's so complex that we really need to work very tight. And these rules helped us to stay on course to build a brand that felt thoroughly considered, cohesive, and recognizable. One frame, two colors, one font. That's it. The best thing about a strong set of rules is also you can break, break them when necessary without syncing the whole system. Allowing room to explore makes an identity feel more alive and dynamic and less boring and corporate. And sometimes, you know, it's just practical. We need to add colors because, you know, flavors. And uh, with so many SKUs and so many product lines, we had to, co to keep the consumer in mind and guide them with something other than type. Okay, also with type. We actually included a secondary font, Caslon Ionic by Commercial Classics. Great job. That was more legible than our font from smaller body copy. This project, though, also could not have happened without a lot of hands on deck. And we'd like to take a moment to recognize them here. So we started with a strategic workshop and we ended with a 53 thousand square foot building that contains the results of many, many months of effort. Both our whole team and the team and John George and the Howard U corporations. We all worked on together. And we hope to go, you go there because there's plenty more than we couldn't fit in this 20 minutes talk. And so next Wednesday, no, please. we'll be giving an exclusive tour pre-opening, it's opening next month. So we encourage you to register for it. It's gonna be in a, maybe Sunday, it's gonna be in the typographic website and there's only 25 seats, so we accept bribes. <laughs> so, thank you very much. I made a phone speaker. <laughs>